Okay, so that's 10 o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So hello, everyone, and welcome to our Q&A with a neurologist webinar uh, with Dr. Jody Kashmir. My name is Declan. I work in client services with the Parkinson Association of Alberta, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit them in the little chat function below. Um, you'll see that little chat blurb icon and you can type your questions um, to Dr. Kashmir in there. And then I will read them out to her if we have time at the end of the webinar. Um, if you had submitted your questions ahead of time, uh, Dr. Kashmir will address those uh, first and foremost. Um, so just a brief disclaimer, this webinar will be recorded. All information provided in the videos by Parkinson Association and the featured speaker is furnished strictly for educational and entertainment purposes only. This service is not intended to be diagnostic, prescriptive, or replace the relationship, advice, and or care of your physician. General questions about symptoms, treatments, available medications, complementary and alternative healthcare therapies, and current research will be fielded. And now I will pass it over to Dr. Kashmir to introduce herself and start the webinar. Good morning, everybody. I wish I could see you because it's weird sitting and talking to my computer and talking to only myself, um, but I hope you're out there and I hope this will be helpful for you. I am a neurologist in Edmonton. I work in the community in Edmonton. I am originally from Saskatchewan, like many uh, Albertans. I went to medical school in Saskatoon and I did my neurology training in Edmonton and I've been here since. I've been working in the Edmonton community since 2004 and my practice does involve seeing a lot of patients with Parkinson's disease but I also do some other things in neurology as well. I thank you for the great questions you have already submitted. I am looking forward to going over them with you. I think you have some great thoughts and questions to ask today. So I've organized the questions into categories just to, because I like to try to be as organized as possible and I hope it will be helpful for you. I will show a couple of slides as we go just to kind of keep things organized in certain topics. And if there's anything that you uh, want me to address at the end, um, please uh, type it into the chat box and I'm happy to address any other questions that come up today. So I'm just going to start by um, uh, going through the outline of the categories I'm gonna go through today. So I'm just gonna share my slides here with you and hope that this works. Hopefully everybody can see that. And please let me know if you cannot. So the outline of what we're going to go through today is the causes of Parkinson's disease, the treatment of motor symptoms, which is going to be the biggest uh, bulk of the questions today and a lot of questions about drug interactions. And then we're going to talk about the non-motor symptoms, which are very important in Parkinson's disease as well. So one of the questions that people frequently ask me is, why do I get Parkinson's disease? And that is a very hard question to answer and there's no real answer out there. So we think it's a combination of factors of the environment, of aging, of genetic predisposition, but for each individual person, we don't know why you get Parkinson's disease. That leads to the second question and a very good question is why is everyone different? So the question is why is everybody so variable? So why do some people respond to medication? Some people respond to surgery. Some people um, have tremor that's very mild whereas other people have uh, constipation and smell problems and writing problems and freezing and all these other symptoms. There may be a role of genetics in that because there have been some genetic mutations that have been associated with Parkinson's disease. Probably about 10% of Parkinson's disease is due to a genetic defect and the genetic uh, malformations can cause a little bit more severe Parkinson's disease. But other than that, we really don't know why some people get more mild symptoms and other people get more severe symptoms. Lifestyle may play a role. People that are more active physically and cognitively um, often do better in the long term. Other medical problems, if you've got a lot of comorbidities, so for example, if you've got lung disease and heart disease and arthritis and bad knees and all these other things contribute to the, the overall burden of disease. Um, 
But in general, we just really don't know why people have some symptoms more than others. Same as why we don't know why one woman gets really bad breast cancer and the other one gets a really mild form of breast cancer. Um, something in our genetics, something in our, in our environment. So I'm gonna go on to address now the questions that are all related to medication. And so I'm just going to read the question that people have submitted to me and then I will answer it. So the first question is, is there a benefit in delaying starting medication? So this would be for people who come in and are newly diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And there is no benefit in delaying starting medication. The time to start medication is individual and it's when the Parkinson's symptoms are affecting your quality of life and your functioning. So some people might have a very mild tremor that only involves their left hand and they're right-handed and it doesn't impact anything they do. They might not need to start medication. Whereas somebody else might have uh, a, just a lot of slowness in their hand, but they wanna be able to do sewing or something that they use their hand a lot for. And so they might start medication because the Parkinson's disease is impacting their uh, functioning. In the studies, it does show that starting medication does improve quality of life. So there's really no reason to delay starting medication. In the past, medication was sometimes delayed because of concerns about long-term side effects of the medication. And of course that is true. All medications have side effects and potential complications. But I think that it's important to focus on living your life now and being the best you can today rather than worrying about something that may or may not happen 10 or 20 years down the road. So the second question is, what is the timeline that medications should be reviewed? So I think this depends on how severe your Parkinson's disease is and the protocols of your neurologist's office. I personally see people every six months, unless they're having a lot of problems. Some neurologists see people every four months or every 12 months, and some people like to come in um, more frequently or less frequently. If you're stable and things are not really changing, then your medications don't need to be reviewed very often. But if you do have a lot of problems, then you would need to contact your neurologist. And the course of Parkinson's disease is usually stable throughout a lifetime. So for example, if somebody has very slowly progressive Parkinson's disease, it doesn't usually change over the course of a month or two. So it usually follows the same trajectory. And so that is addressing the question that is, does the timeline for assessing medication change as the disease progresses? And that is not necessarily, it just depends how people are doing. Um, the next question is a tough one. Um, what do you do if you need to make medication adjustments between your neurologist's appointment if your medications are not working? And this really depends on the relationship you have with your neurologist and how their, their office communicates. So if you have questions, um, you could probably phone them and leave a message and they could get back to you at their convenience. Or if they email, you could send an email with your uh, questions. Sometimes with my patients, I will give them tips for the future. For example, I say we're starting with one tablet three times a day. If this isn't enough or you're having more problems at night, take an extra one at bedtime. So I might give them the next step that I'm thinking in my mind that we're going to do. But it's also hard for a neurologist because we only see people for 30 minutes every few months, whereas you live with your Parkinson's disease every single day and every single minute. So sometimes it's easier for you to be able to judge your medications. I might tell you to take your medication at eight and 10, but you wanna play pickleball at 11 when your medication's wearing off and then that's suboptimal for your functioning. So um, one thing that can be very helpful is if you keep a calendar or a diary for the day, um, start every hour, say 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and write on, off, tremors worse, um, moods worse, medications not working, I have dyskinesias, however you're feeling every hour, and then we can see if there's a pattern that's emerging over a few days, and if your medication is always wearing off at a certain time, then just certain doses can be changed. But as a neurologist, I don't see your life and your functioning every day. So I need you to come and tell me that information about when you need your medications to be working and when they are and are not working. 
The next question is what medications should you not take with your Parkinson medication? And there is really no definite interactions except with the medication that you see listed here as risagiline or azelect. And so I'm just gonna to go to the next screen and then I'll come back to this one. Risagiline does have quite a lot of interactions. It interacts with narcotics. Um, it interacts with an herbal product called St. John's wort that sometimes people use for depression. It use com, um, interacts with a very common muscle relaxant, which is cyclobenzaprine or called flexoril. It's the one that looks like a little tiny house. It also interacts with over-the-counter medications, which is important for you to know, um, cough suppressants and decongestants. So you should always check with your pharmacist if you're buying any over-the-counter medications. And it also interacts with some of the older antidepressant medications. These are very old antidepressants that I have not seen used since I've been in practice, but um, Nardil or Parnate, but they're, uh, I wouldn't expect that anybody would be on them anymore. The other medications for Parkinson's disease, which are listed here, do not have any interactions. There are some medications that people with Parkinson's disease should not take because they decrease dopamine. And we know Parkinson's disease is caused by a lack of dopamine. So the medications that people should not take are medications that are dopamine depleting drugs. That can be anti-nausea medications, particularly Maxaran is a very commonly used medication for nausea and that can make Parkinson's symptoms worse. And the other dopamine depleting medications are the ones that are used for psychosis, for hallucinations, for people with schizophrenia. So those would be other medications that can um, make Parkinson's disease worse and cause more Parkinson's symptoms that should be avoided. But the common medication that everybody will eventually take would be levodopa, and levodopa does not interact with any other medications. It might interact with iron, so you might not wanna take it with iron supplements, um, and it does interact with protein because protein blocks the absorption of the medication. So if you're taking your medication when you're eating and you're eating food that has protein in it, then you might not get the full benefit of your medication which is why you should ideally take the medication 30 minutes before you eat or two hours after you eat, um, unless the medication is really upsetting your stomach and you need to take it with a little bit of food. And in that case, you should try to take it with something that's not protein. So this isn't a question, but I'm just gonna go through this um, quickly because the medications can be a little bit confusing and I wanted to write them down so that you have them and see them. So the number one medication that everybody with Parkinson's disease will take eventually is levodopa. Comes in two formulations. Cinemet is the more commonly used one, which is levodopa and carbidopa. And prolopa is the other one that comes as a capsule and it is levodopa and benserazide. Carbidopa and benserazide are both enzymes that block the um, digestion or the um, processing of the medication in the gut so that it can actually get into the bloodstream and get into the brain. So it is an enzyme that has to be added to levodopa so that you can actually get it into your brain. The other category of medication is dopamine agonists that stimulate your own dopamine receptors. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors and COMPT inhibitors are all drugs that block the um, processing of Cinemet or levodopa in the body so that it stays around in your system longer. Uh, mantidine is um, sometimes used for mild Parkinson's disease or for dyskinesias. And then the anticholinergics are an older class of drugs that are really used mainly for tremor, but they have a lot of serious side effects, particularly cognitive slowing, um, drowsiness, falls. So we try not to use those medications. Some really young people with Parkinson's disease that have bad tremor might be taking them, but it's pretty infrequent that people would be taking these medications just because they're not tolerated because of the side effects. So uh, I'll get back to my questions. Hope that uh, was uh, clear to you. Um, there's a question about gabapentin. Gabapentin is a very commonly used medication which was designed for seizures, but has been found to help with almost everything else out there, particularly commonly used for pain or restless legs. It does not interact with any of these medications that are listed here. It doesn't interact with anything for Parkinson's disease, so it's perfectly safe to use. The next question is what triggers dyskinesias? 
So dyskinesias are restless, fidgety movements. If you've ever seen Michael J. Fox in an interview, he's kind of moving around. Those are the dyskinesias. And that is a side effect of taking levodopa. The longer you take levodopa and the higher the doses of levodopa, the higher the chance of getting dyskinesias. But sometimes people get them really bad on a low dose and sometimes people never get them on a high dose. The um, dyskinesias are strictly really related to the levodopa. The second, or the next question, sorry, is what is dystonia? So dystonia um, means a prolonged muscle contraction. So I don't know if you can see my hand, but sometimes the hand going into a spasm or the arm going into a spasm like this, or the foot turning in is a very common one. Dystonia is uh, also a side effect of levodopa. It can occur when the medication's wearing off. So oftentimes when your dose is kind of running at the end of its cycle, then you might develop dystonia. Sometimes people get it in the morning because the medication wears off overnight and then they get that, especially the foot dystonia. It can also occur after you've taken your medication, at the peak of your medication, or it can go up and down. The only way that we can really track that is, again, if you keep that chart that I mentioned at the beginning of how you're doing every hour, and then we can see um, if that could be related to the timing of your medication. Dystonia is treated by adjusting the timing of the Parkinson medication. So maybe taking the medications more frequently, a smaller dose more frequently, or adding a dopamine agonist or one of these other drugs can increase the uh, decrease, sorry, decrease the wearing off so that you can try to treat that dystonia. And sometimes dystonia is also treated with Botox injections. Uh, Botox injections are injections into the muscle that weaken the muscle so that it doesn't go into that um, prolonged contraction. And Botox does wear off after a few months, so it needs to be repeated. I don't think I have any patients that have dystonia that's severe enough for Botox, but uh, Botox can certainly be used if it's very problematic. The next question is a very hot topic question, which is marijuana. So the question is, what is the research findings on the effectiveness of marijuana in treatment of Parkinson's disease or its symptoms? So. <clears throat> excuse me, marijuana, as you probably know, is a combination of two factors, uh, THC, which is the psychotropic part that makes people high, and CBD, and CBD is the part that has probably more medical benefit. We know there are CBD receptors throughout the brain, including the basal ganglia, where Parkinson's comes from. So theoretically, uh, the CBD part, which is called cannabinoids, may be of benefit, but there have not been any really good trials yet. There have been four small trials published that looked at anywhere from seven to 20 patients, but they weren't uh, controlled trials and they um, haven't, they were conflicting. So some found an evidence of benefit and tremor and others did not. So we really don't have any conclusive evidence of benefit in Parkinson's disease, but trials are ongoing right now. The role I think that uh, marijuana, particularly CBD, may play for people with Parkinson's disease is treating some of the symptoms. So there are studies that um, marijuana or CBD, I'm gonna just call it CBD from now on, uh, can help pain, anxiety, and sleep. And I think that if all of those factors are better, then you feel better and your Parkinson's disease seems better and more manageable. I have seen my patients who have taken it for pain, um, for back pain, for example, have been able to exercise more and then that is very helpful for their Parkinson's disease. Sleep is very important as the time that the body heals itself. So if your sleep improves, that makes everything else better as well. So in my experience and in the studies that have been done, I think there may be a benefit for sleep, anxiety and pain and whether it has any benefit in Parkinson's disease is a big question mark, but we don't have any evidence or proof uh, at this point. Uh, next question. Uh, somebody is switching from Prolopa to Stilevo and they wanna know about Stilevo. So Stilevo or Stilevo is here. It is a medication that is a combination of cinnamon. So it's levodopa, carbidopa combined with Comptan. The benefit of the Stilevo is that you don't have to take as many pills because it's all combined into one pill. The 
Medication also has five different doses, so it's a little bit easier to make more adjustments. It comes in 50 and 75 and 100 and 125 and 150, whereas Cinemet, the main form of Cinemet really only comes as 100 slash 25. So um, it just gives you more options. And so Steliva was approved in the US in 2003, probably shortly thereafter in Canada, although I'm not sure the exact date. I've been practicing since 2004 and I think I've pretty much always used it in my practice. So it's been around for a long time. And like I said, it is a combination of these two medications that have also been used for a long time. So uh, we know the medication very well and are very familiar with it. And it is covered, um, some of the issues in the past is, wasn't covered for some people, but it is covered um, in, for people in Alberta through Blue Cross. Okay, so I'm going to leave this topic of medications now, but we can come back to it if anybody has any questions at the end. And we're going to go on to this very big category of non-motor manifestations. So the motor manifestations of Parkinson's disease are the hallmark features that we use to make the diagnosis. So that would be tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, which is slowness of movements, and postural instability. Those are the cardinal features, but the non-motor manifestations can be more bothersome and impair functioning more than the motor manifestations in some people. So all of the questions I'm going to be addressing now are going to be related to these various non-motor manifestations. So first question, how common is dementia and will everyone get it? So in the studies, it seems that people when they're first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, about 15% have mild cognitive impairment. That might be a little bit of memory problems, a little bit of slower processing speeds, um, a little bit of decreased working memory. Dementia is more common in people with Parkinson's disease than the general population, but the big risk factor for getting dementia is really aging. Overall in the studies, anywhere from 40 to 60% of people will get dementia. But again, it really just depends on age as well because age is the big risk factor for getting dementia. Um, but definitely everyone with Parkinson's disease absolutely does not get dementia. Um, sometimes people do have mild cognitive symptoms like I was mentioning. The biggest thing is slower processing of uh, activities and slower processing of words, a bit of word finding problems. Um, that's why it's important to keep up your cognitive activities. And I preach this all the time to my patients so they'll know it well. Um, keep active, uh, keep active physically and keep active intellectually. Uh, computer games, puzzles, uh, social interactions, those things are really important. And Parkinson's Alberta does a good job of having a lot of different programs available. Next question is how do you deal with hallucinations in Parkinson patients? So, First of all, the question I would ask is why are they having hallucinations? Is it from the Parkinson's disease or, for, or is it from something else? Just because you have Parkinson's disease doesn't mean that that is to blame for everything. So it's important to make sure there's no other cause for hallucinations, a problem with medications or a bladder infection or low sodium or thyroid problems. Lots of different medical problems can cause that. So that would be the first step is to rule out all the other causes of hallucinations. If there's no other cause and it seems to be related to the Parkinson's disease, my question is, does the hallucination bother you? So hallucinations can be common in people with Parkinson's disease, but they often retain the insight that they are hallucinations. So people might see little animals in their room at night or see a person that's not there or a shadow, but it's not uh, bothersome, it's not worrisome to them, it doesn't scare them, and so we really don't need to do anything about the hallucinations unless it's actually being bothersome. If it is bothersome, then the first thing is to try to adjust the environment, so make sure there's a light on or a night light on or, you know, remove curtains or, you know, make it a good environment where people aren't scared. The second um, thing is to look at medications. A lot of medications can contribute to hallucinations. And if we go back to my medication slide, um, all of these medications cause hallucinations, um, including the anticholinergics, amantadine, um, dopamine agonists, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and COMPT inhibitors. So what we would do is try to decrease or get rid of those medications 
starting with the anticholinergics and amantadine, and then moving through the other medications. And if necessary, reducing the dose um, or reducing the dose of levodopa, especially at night. Hallucinations tend to be worse at night, um, but usually we would get rid of all of the other medications and levodopa would be the mainstay because levodopa is the medication that definitely works the best for Parkinson's disease. So I hope that helped with the hallucinations question. The next question is pain. And pain is a funny thing with Parkinson's disease because you wouldn't think that Parkinson's disease would cause pain, but yet it seems to. And there are probably multiple different mechanisms for this. Obviously the stiffness and rigidity that go with Parkinson's disease can cause pain, especially some things like shoulder pain or neck pain. Um, but sometimes people also just get this widespread pain that's hard to characterize. It can be associated with wearing off of your medication. So for example, if you take your medication at eight o'clock and then your pain gets worse around 11, it might be because your medication's wearing off and the pain might be directly related to the lack of dopamine. And again, another reason why you keep a calendar or a chart during the day so that we can see when the pain is occurring. Um, in that case, um, adjusting the Parkinson medications, the increasing the dose or increasing the frequency of medication may be helpful. Um, if the pain is secondary to other problems like the stiffness or rigidity, increasing the Parkinson's medication may also be helpful um, in that. So um, it's tricky to figure out um, where the pain is coming from. And uh, related to that is how do you tell if your pain is from Parkinson's disease or from arthritis? So arthritis typically causes joint pain swelling and stiffness. So the joints that we expect to be involved would be hips, knees, back, and probably hands. Those are the common ones. So if your pain seems to be in the joint and your joint is stiff and it's, it's hard to get it moving and it seems to be originating from the joint, then it's probably your arthritis. If the pain is more widespread or feels like it's in the muscles or is related to the timing of your Parkinson medication, then it's probably more due to the uh, Parkinson's disease. A related question, again, is back pain related to the Parkinson's disease stoop? And the answer is possibly. Back pain is really common. 85% of the population has mechanical back pain at some point. Mechanical back pain refers to pain coming from the muscles, tendons, ligaments, joints, bones. And so all of those structures in the back cause pain and our backs take a lot of wear and tear over the lifetime. So a lot of people will get back pain. But when you have Parkinson's disease and you are rigid or stiff, that can, the muscles are contracted and that can contribute to back pain. And the stoop can a little bit, but I think the rigidity from Parkinson's disease is the bigger uh, contribution rather than the stoop because the stoop's usually only there if you're walking whereas the back pain can be there in any position. And the next question is pertaining to sleep, and it is if melatonin and magnesium supplements used for sleep have any adverse effects on Parkinson's disease? And the answer is no. Um, magnesium supplements are fine. The melatonin supplements are fine. Um, somebody asked me about the dosing of melatonin. I usually suggest that people start with a two milligrams at bedtime, it's always best to take the lowest dose of medication possible. If that doesn't work, you can increase to five milligrams and 10 milligrams should be the maximum. Um, most people probably take around five milligrams. The next uh, question is related to comorbidities and that is partic in particular strokes. So stroke and Parkinson's disease are completely separate issues with the brain. But the more hits your brain takes, the harder it is uh, to recover and function. So Parkinson's disease does not increase your risk of stroke. Uh, the risk factors for stroke are high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, family history, smoking, unhealthy diet, and lack of exercise. People with um, Parkinson's disease who are hospitalized for any reason, for stroke or for hip replacement or for any other uh, surgical intervention or medical problem, often find that they are worse while they're in hospital. And this is because of the change in routine. 
So routine is very important for Parkinson's disease. As you probably know, taking your medication and your food and everything on a very rigid schedule is critical for having the maximum functioning during the day. And in the hospital, you don't have control over your schedule. And so it can uh, be very difficult to get your medications at the same time or the same way that you were getting them at home. Also being inactive in the hospital um, makes Parkinson's disease worse. Not moving is the worst thing you can do because it's really, really important to be active. And so uh, patients with stroke or other problems who are hospitalized often feel like their Parkinson's disease is worse. Usually that it would be temporary, but it does take much longer to recover than you think it should. Um, so oftentimes it'll take six months after a hospital stay before people get back to their baseline. Uh, part, strokes usually do not impact the Parkinson's symptoms, um, which is one of the questions, um, but it just, this whole factor of being hospitalized and being less mobile is the important factor. The next question is, does Parkinson's disease increase the startle reflex? And I had to think about this one, um, and I don't think that it does. I have not seen that or read that. People with Parkinson's disease often have a less, uh, less response or less startle. So I don't think that Parkinson's disease has anything to do with startle reflex. The only connection I can think of is anxiety. Anxiety is very common in people with Parkinson's disease and anxiety can be very bad. People that are anxious have this heightened awareness and anxiety makes uh, startle reflex worse. So in that case, if, they, uh, if you're a person with Parkinson's disease and a lot of anxiety, maybe that could be contributing to the startle reflex, but Parkinson's itself should not. And next question is, um, Somebody has a spouse who pockets food. So what this means is put food in the mouth and keep it in the cheeks rather than swallowing it. And it takes a very long time, you know, two hours to get through a meal because of this really slow eating. Um, and what to do about this and any help with swallowing. So um, obviously a swallowing assessment is the first step. And I think this person has already had a swallowing assessment. But this behavior of pocketing food is not really a swallowing problem. It is a cognitive problem or a behavioral problem of putting the food there and leaving it there and not going through the normal mechanisms of swallowing. People with Parkinson's disease can get something called punding, which is doing repetitive behaviors over and over again. And pocketing food might be one of these. Other things would be lining things up, counting things, taking everything out of a drawer, putting everything back. These kind of uh, repetitive behaviors can be part of Parkinson's disease. So the problem with the pocketing of food isn't really the swallowing mechanism itself, it's the behavior. So the only thing you can really do to manage that is um, cueing while you're eating. So um, basically reminding them to swallow sips, uh, taking drinks between all, all the bites so that they swallow, um, being upright, being um, attentive during meals. The um, food consistency um, was uh, also related to this question. And sometimes if you are truly having trouble swallowing, then the speech therapist would recommend a pureed diet. Um, which isn't that appealing to most people out there. Um, but there are things that you can do to make it better. Um, protein shakes are really important. People with Parkinson's disease often lose weight, so they really need to get more protein intake. So I um, encourage people to use a shake. Sometimes using a straw um, can be helpful for those people that um, have problems with pocketing. Um, but really the treatment for pocketing is really just re constant reminders and it can be very difficult for the caregiver. And that I think wraps up the uh, list of questions that I was provided in advance. So I hope I have been able to answer your questions. If I have not, please uh, send it in the chat and I will try to uh, clarify. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Kashmir. Uh, let me see here. So we do have a couple of uh, other questions and just a reminder for everybody um, that's here, you can put your questions in the chat box below. Um, it will look like the little, a little speaking blurb there. Um, the first question is, 
um, about research. Is Canada involved with uh, the gene testing that is being done in the United States uh, for Parkinson's research? Um, Canada is involved in, in a lot of research. I uh, personally am not working in the community, so I don't know everything that's happening about research, even in Alberta, to be honest, but there are many centers that are doing a lot of research in um, Canada. I would suggest if you're looking for that information, there's two good sources. One is Fox Trial Finder. So that's through Michael J. Fox's uh, website. Um, he actually has a list of all the trials that are ongoing, so you can see what the trials are and where they are, go where they are happening. And the other is the um, clinicaltrials.gov, so clinicaltrials, all one word, .gov, which is from the National Institute of Health in the United States, and they keep track of all trials occurring internationally. So they can, you can see where trials are happening in Canada, in the United States, around the world, hundreds of pages of trials going on for Parkinson's disease. Um, but that's really interesting websites to look through and uh, see the research that's going on. Genetic research is uh, a hot topic um, since some new genes have been discovered associated with Parkinson's disease. And because in some other areas, they have found um, genetic treatments for some conditions that you can actually change the genetics. So there, that will be potentially an option for Parkinson's disease. If you know what the genetic mutation is and you can change that genetic mutation in the cell, then you could pre uh, preventually uh, cure Parkinson's disease in the people with that particular genetic mutation. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to... Um stop your screen sharing for one moment so that the participants can see me as well. Okay, there we go. Right. Um, so we've got a couple other questions here. Um, does the calm tan that you mentioned before help with the nausea from levodopa? And I believe there's this question is about nausea as well. So I'll ask them both at the same time. Uh, what precautions and process should be taken when switching from levocarb, 100 over 25 milligrams, to prolopa, um, uh, with the reason being help with nausea? Um, the patient experiences adverse reactions to new medications, which lands him in the hospital at times, and they're cautious to start new medications. Um, how does one professionally and respectfully go about finding a new neurologist? Okay, so this is quite this is quite a few questions. Maybe we'll start <laughs> okay. with the, the nausea basis. There are so many. I can only remember so much. I only have so much working memory. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. Comtan, first of all, Comtan does not help with nausea. Comtan keeps levodopa in the system longer, and so if you're getting nausea from your levodopa, it can actually make it worse. The medication that does help with nausea that people will take with their levodopa is called domperidone. So it is a specific medication that treats nausea associated for people with Parkinson's disease. It's the best option and you would take it when you take levodopa. Mm -hmm. So when you're switching from the Cinemet formulation to the Prolopa formulation, um, there's not really any rules about switching. Um, you generally would switch a similar dose. So if you were taking 100 on 25 of Cinemet, you would switch to 125 of Prolopa. Prolopa. Prolopa is a capsule. It does have a different enzyme. So like I said, some people just absorb it better or feel better on it, but it's the same situation as say you have a headache and you go to the drugstore and you take Advil or Tylenol or aspirin. Some people like one or some people like the other, um, but there's not one that is better than the other. Mm, and if you're very um, sensitive to medication, which can be the case for many people, is that you always want to start at the lowest dose possible and go very slowly. With Prolopa, the lowest dose that, that it comes in is 50 uh, slash 12.5. And that is a capsule, so you can't break that one. You can, only can take that lowest dose. Great, thank you. Um, the third part of that question, I think, was about how do you find a uh, neurologist? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, how does one professionally and respectfully go about finding a new neurologist? So um, the way the healthcare system works in Canada is that you need to be referred from a family physician. So the question would be that you would talk to your family physician about it, and then your family physician would put in a referral to a neurologist. Great, thank you. Um, we do have quite a few. We've got about four more here. Um, do you have any suggestions to help with freezing when walking? Oh, that's such a tough one. 
it's it's a really hard symptom of Parkinson's disease and it's, it's completely unpredictable, which makes it so difficult for people. So freezing, uh, for those that don't know, is that when you're trying to walk and you just freeze and you can't get going, often occurs when you're first starting to walk is often when it's at its worst or when you're turning a corner or, or going through a doorway or something that's a barrier, then the freezing happens. None of the medication for Parkinson's disease work for freezing, unfortunately. So um, changing medication really doesn't seem to make any difference. They've done various studies of different medications and none of them really seem to help with freezing. So we suggest that people try to use um, non-medical um, cues and the physiotherapists are very good at teaching this if you've ever been to the CRIS program. It's a, a great uh, problem, a uh, great issue that they help with. Um, humming in your head, singing, distracting your brain can sometimes be helpful. I once saw a video of a, a patient uh, at a conference and to get rid of freezing, he would do like a skating move. And then as soon as he was doing that skating move, he wouldn't freeze anymore and he could move again. It's just getting a different pathway in the brain going. Um, some people will use laser pointers or as something to step over. There are laser shoes. So lasers that you can actually put on your shoes that give you a little line or a mark in front of you that triggers your brain to kind of keep going. Um, sometimes people have canes that do the, do a similar thing. Great. But definitely if you have a physiotherapist, um, ask your physiotherapist because they have some other solutions and, and suggestions as well. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, the next question is, does Parkinson's cause an overactive bladder? Yes. Um, bladder, bowel, sexual dysfunction can all occur with Parkinson's disease, not necessarily, but in some people it can. So that is something that is quite manageable these days. Um, we often would start by doing a test called a post void residual, which is a bladder ultrasound. Basically, you drink a lot, you get an ultrasound, you pee, and they re-ultrasound your bladder to see how, how well your bladder's emptying. If your bladder is emptying for the most part, then there are a bunch of different medications that can be used to treat that overactive bladder. So there's probably five or six different medications. So definitely uh, even to speak with your family doctor about that, because that's something that can definitely be addressed. Mm. Great. Um, this next one is a, a two-part question in regards to uh, Parkinson's Plus. Um, so they're asking, what is the difference between PSP and MSA? Um, and the second portion of the question is, um, what would be the factors to help determine if you should go onto a feeding tube or not? Um, okay, I'm gonna address the feeding tube question first and then I'll come back to the Parkinson Plus. The question about a feeding tube is a very individual decision about uh, quality of life and your goals in life. So that's not really something that anybody can answer for you. It's something that you have to answer for yourself in discussion with your close family or friends. It's a, it's a tough decision for people that can't swallow um, and they, you know, want to improve their quality of life, improve their nutrition, then I have seen some of my Parkinson patients get feeding tubes, um, but it's not for everybody. So it just depends on what your personal long-term goals are. I'm gonna uh, just share screen for a second here again to come back to the Parkinson Plus question. I anticipated that I might get questions on that topic, but I didn't, so I didn't address them, but mm. I think I have a slide on that. Oh, sorry, there we go. So um, this is something that confuses people and it's because we use language that is confusing. So Parkinsonism refers to symptoms that look like Parkinson's. So slowness, stiffness, shaking. The most common is idiopathic Parkinson's disease, which is what the majority of people have. Um, but there are other things that can look like Parkinson's disease and are not. Um, people that have really bad vascular disease in their brain, certain medications, infections, head injuries, toxins. There's a few secondary causes of Parkinsonism that we as neurologists always think of, but they're all very rare. And then to address the question that was asked is about the Parkinson plus syndromes. Now, I usually think of these conditions as cousins of Parkinson's disease. So they're very, very similar to Parkinson's disease, but they're not quite the same. So these, fe these conditions all have the same features of Parkinson's disease, which is the slowness and shaking and stiffness, but they have other things that go with them. 
So with multiple system atrophy, the things that go with that are autonomic dysfunction. And autonomic means things that happen automatically in your body. So digestion, um, bladder, bowel function, blood pressure control, sweating, um, all of those uh, features along with cerebellar. Cerebellar is what controls our balance. So people uh, can become very unsteady. It's more like a drunk kind of staggering balance problem rather than the typical Parkinson's walk and then Parkinsonism. So it's a combination of those three factors for multiple system atrophy. For progressive supranuclear palsy, the hallmark feature is that people have an eye movement disorder. So their eyes do not track. They don't look up or, or look down. And so that's one of the things that we always look for as neurologists. People often get this very bad axial rigidity, which means their neck is very stiff and they kind of have this staring appearance like this. When they have PSP, the eyes are really wide open and the neck is very stiff. And people with PSP often have more cognitive problems and have really bad falls, just unpredictable falls in all directions that occurs very early in the disease. Whereas in Parkinson's disease, most people don't fall at the beginning and they don't, maybe they don't ever fall, but uh, with PSP falling is a very uh, key feature right at the beginning. So that's the difference between multiple system atrophy and progressive supranuclear palsy. Great, thank you so much. Um, so we've got four more questions here and we've got about 10 more minutes in the webinar. So I might, um, depending on how long these take, these might be the last four questions um, that we'll get to today. Um, so the first one is, does Parkinson's cause hammer toes? No, it doesn't. Hmm. Perfect. Uh, <laughs> short and sweet. Um, <laughs> I could get through lots of questions like yeah, this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, any tips for managing the anxieties uh, that you discussed earlier? Yeah, um, I always like to start with a non-medical approach. So I always uh, would suggest trying things that are not taking medication. And so sometimes exercise, it can be a great way of managing anxiety. Um, sometimes listening to music or playing a musical instrument, going for a walk, singing, um, reading a book, you know, finding things that are important to you or that can relax your mind can be helpful for managing anxiety. Um, and sometimes doing something physical can alleviate anxiety if you're having a temporary anxiety, say, you know, going up and down stairs a couple times or going outside and walking a, a lap around the block to manage that uh, acute anxiety. If that doesn't work, then I look at if anxiety is related to the Parkinson medications. Is it occurring when the medication wears off? If so, you might need more medication or more frequent medication. Um, and then finally, if it's not related to the timing of the Parkinson medications, I would look at using a medication to treat anxiety. Uh, the first line medications are usually the antidepressant medications that can be helpful for anxiety. Um, Remeron is another antidepressant medication that can be helpful. Um, so that would be the next step. And the very last step is the, is the step that people usually like, which is the benzodiazepines, things like Ativan or Valium or Clonazepam, which are relaxant medications. And they work well for anxiety, but they tend to have a lot of side effects in Parkinson's disease. So we really don't like to use them. They are addictive uh, for one thing, um, but they also can contribute to cognitive problems and falls. And so that's really the very last resort, but can be a rescue medication if people have occasional episodes of very severe anxiety. Great, thank you. Um, next question here is, can you discuss body odor associated with Parkinson's? Um, I have not really seen this or um, heard of this in the literature. Um, I know that some people with Parkinson's disease do have alterations in sweating. Um, people can have a lot of sweating or um, uh, really unpredictable sweating, which can sometimes also be associated with the timing of Parkinson medications. So if that, if it seems, the body odor seems to be related to sweating, then keep track of when the sweating is occurring to see if it could be related to the medication and maybe the medication timing could be adjusted a little bit. Um, if it's just overall body odor, I don't know that it would be really specifically related to Parkinson's disease. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the next question here, I have no tremors, but do have constant dizziness. 
can I still have dizziness? I'm assuming they mean, can I still have Parkinson's? Parkinson's, yeah. So about 20% of people with Parkinson's disease do not have tremor. Um, so it's a little bit harder to diagnose because most people are used to seeing that kind of typical, what we call the pill rolling tremor. Um, so the people without uh, tremor often have more um, stiffness and rigidity. And so you can have Parkinson's disease with or without tremor. Dizziness is a really tough symptom <laughs> for, for neurologists uh, because everything out there seems to cause dizziness. Um, and dizziness is a really bad problem for people with Parkinson's disease. Um, the first thing to look for is dizziness related to blood pressure. And people with Parkinson's disease get something called orthostatic um, hypotension or orthostatic lightheadedness, which is the feeling when you stand up quickly and you feel like woozy off balance. And so what's happening in that situation is you're getting up and your blood pressure is dropping. And when the blood pressure drops, you get dizzy. And so that's the first thing to do is to check your blood pressure. And you need to check your blood pressure laying down. And then you need to check your blood pressure when you're standing for one minute and five minutes. If your blood pressure is dropping, that could be because of, because of Parkinson's disease or Parkinson's disease medications. And there is treatment for that. So that is something that should be addressed. I also have many people with Parkinson's disease that, I, um, that I'm so sad for every time I see them because I know they just has got this chronic dizziness that's there all the time and they just always feel lightheaded, woozy, off balance. And it just doesn't seem to be related to the timing of the Parkinson medication. And there's really nothing that fixes that kind of problem. Um, but it, it is very common in people with Parkinson's disease. Mm, great. Um, that took less time than I thought, so we've got a couple more questions here, and I guess I'll just keep posing them until we, we get to uh, 11 o'clock if participants still have questions here. Um, this question asks, does it matter what kind of movement you do, or is it just important to keep moving, or as long as you mm -hmm. keep moving? I like this question. People, my patients out there who know me know I love to preach about exercise. So um, there are a lot of trials going on. I wish I could show you the graph. I saw it recently at a, a Parkinson's meeting that showed the exercise trials were something that really didn't occur much in the 80s or 90s. And in the last decade, the number of uh, trials of research, uh, research trials in Parkinson's disease have just absolutely shot up. The thought is that the more vigorous exercise may be more beneficial. So walking at a good pace, a good pace is that your heart rate is up, uh, you're little, you feel a little bit winded, it's, you know, you have to work a little bit of extra effort, that would be walking at a, at a good pace. Um, stationary biking or cycling um, are also really good exercises. Again, you want to work at a pace that's a, that you're challenging yourself a little bit. Um, but there's also studies of yoga, of dance, of boxing, obviously. Um, probably the more vigorous activity you can do, the better, but really any activity is going to make a big difference. And really, we know that exercise is the only thing that slows the progression of Parkinson's disease. So if there's only one thing that you can do, it's exercise. So really, really critical. That should be your treatment. That should be the number one prescription before any medication or, or before anything else that's important in your life. It should be fitting in the exercise. Um, as, as much as you can do, um, try to make a goal of 30 minutes a day. And um, the other thing is that you have to keep it up. So once you stop exercising, you lose the benefit of exercising. So it has to be something that becomes part of your regular routine. You can't just sign up for an exercise class for this semester and think, well, I'm gonna do my exercise and I'm gonna be fine from now on. Um, it's something that has to be part of your lifestyle. Great. But this, the trials that are going on, um, just to kind of, kind of roll back to this question is that, um, with vigorous walking and with treadmill and with cycling. So those are the ones that, um, that they're able to kind of study in the lab and show that people who are having more effort, um, are, Parkinson's disease seems to be better. Awesome. Um, and last question I've got here, are headaches associated with PD? This was one of the earlier symptoms um, that they experienced. Headaches are another tough thing because 80% of the population gets headaches. Parkinson's disease um, itself, um, due to lack of dopamine or the changes that occur in the brain are not in, in areas that are involved in headaches. So Parkinson's itself does not cause headache, 
but secondary effects from Parkinson's disease can cause headache, particularly if you get a stiff in your neck or your shoulders, that rigidity or that stiffness can contribute to headaches. Um, also, people who have blood pressure that drops can get this feeling of pressure in their head and their neck kind of coming across here, um, which can be related to the blood pressure dropping in, in Parkinson's disease. So it's not a direct effect, but it can be from those other uh, manifestations of Parkinson's disease. Great, thank you. And with that, that is our last question. Um, so thank you so much, Dr. Kashmir, for taking the time to join us today and share your knowledge. You're very um, welcome. I just wish I could see all you out there. So I say hello to, to all my patients and everybody who, who is watching. And um, it's hard giving a talk when you can't see the audience, but I hope this has been helpful for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you to everybody who was able to attend live and share your questions, uh, both in advance and on the spot. We hope you will join us at our next scheduled webinar, which is on November 4th, the first and third Wednesdays of the month. Um, and our next webinar is on pain and Parkinson's. For more information on Parkinson Association of Alberta, please visit our website, parkinsonassociation.ca, or follow us on social media. All webinars are recorded and shared on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you think that you missed something today or you'd like to rewind and listen to um, Dr. Kashmir's answer again, this will be on our YouTube channel within the next couple of days. Perfect, so we'll end it there. Have a good day, everybody. Bye everyone, take care. Get out and exercise. <laughs> stay healthy, stay well. <laughs>